Hello everyone. Welcome back to the Tuned and Toned podcast. We are here again at Big Ben Strength and Conditioning with Coach Brian Chambers. And today we are going to talk about um, off-season preparation for performing artists. Um, so in athletics, right, we have the different seasons mm-hmm. that you guys prep for. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to do just like a quick rundown of what those are for athletes so we can then kind sure. of explain that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We basically, um, we basically have three, maybe some people consider a fourth. Uh, we have an off season and then we have an in season and then we have uh, a peak or a preseason. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I got most of those in the right order. And so off season is usually about six weeks and that's where we're not doing any of the competitive lifts that we would normally do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, uh, we'll call it preseason, sorry, is gonna be usually a longer period of time and that's gonna be getting a little bit more focused on the competitive lifts. And then the last part is gonna be doing almost exclusively what we do in competition, and then just keeping maintenance level with all of our other structural work. Yeah. So uh, that's pretty much the same for you. Right, right. Um, So today we're just gonna talk about the off season. So for performing artists, um, the correlation would be you just finished a run of performances and you're not gonna have any more coming up for at least month and a half, something like that. Probably that's about the minimum. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really kind of going to depend on what your seasons look like. So if you're in academics, then usually the summers are off unless you have a conference. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a really big off season for us. Um, So when I'm in off season, really, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences in here, what I'm doing in the gym specifically for off season. Um, there's there's other things I'm doing at home, of course, and I'll, I'll write about those and post those up, but when I'm in the gym is what I wanted to talk about today. So for me, for off season, and really, it, it kind of goes beyond the off season, but I'm really starting everything with focusing on the major structural muscles, and especially those that have weaknesses, right? So that would be, um, the major, major structural muscles are, of course, always throughout all the seasons going to be the deep abdominal muscles like the psoas, which we have a video about, mm-hmm. and uh, the low abs and obliques, which are down here, anything to do with the low back, that sort of stuff. Um, and then since I'm a clarinetist and saxophonist, um, really this is where I'm going to do things like work on grip mm-hmm. and forearms, hand intensive right. stuff. Things that you can't really afford to do in season, right? Things yeah. that I, yeah. Because if say you say you rip your hand, right? Or you know you just you overdo it on the forearm work, right? And then you're super sore. It's right. not something that you can afford to have when you've got performances coming up, right? Right. I don't want to be sitting there trying to play. I don't mm-hmm. know Daphnis or something. And, and all like, you can think about is your right. It hurts so bad, sore. or yeah. it's slowing me down. Right. Exactly. That sort of thing. Um, so that's where this sort of work comes in, and it's. Uh, I think it's important to know, especially for somebody like me, um, I know there are a lot of musicians and, um, yeah, mostly musicians who have actually weak grips. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have that problem. Right. My problem is that I have a strong grip, but it's very lopsided. So I tend to use predominantly the outer forearm instead of the inner forearm. Mm -hmm. Um, So that would be, even if you have a strong grip, why? that would still be important if you have some sort of imbalance, identifying that and working on the higher liability stuff. Yep. Um, anything that you would consider helpful but more high risk, yep. which in here we don't really do a lot of high risk stuff per se. But there are there are obviously things that are um, higher risk than others. Yeah. You know, for example, like walking is very low risk compared right. to a farmer's <laughs> carry which is right. holding dumbbells down by your sides. There's gonna be a slight difference, right? right? And especially if we're talking heavy dumbbells, mm-hmm. yeah. um, the heavier the, they are, the more high risk they are, but they right. can be very helpful right. for grip training. Mm-hmm. And they're not as high liability as some of the other grip work in that right. you can drop them when you need to. Yep, exactly. Um, which is pretty much the same thing that we do for, uh, for weightlifting. And uh, off season is just working anything that we don't do in season Mm -hmm. um, and anything that we for some reason can't do Mm -hmm. so a lot of off season is finding out something that somebody can't do for some reason right and then just hammering that until it's not a weakness for them anymore right Um, Right. for example for weightlifters who typically move bars up and down overhead we're gonna do a lot of bench press in front and a lot of rows pulling Mm -hmm. towards us Mm -hmm. so that we're working you know 
keeping a well-rounded back the whole time. Right, right, and that's actually... <laughs> a well-rounded back. <laughs> well-rounded uh, and well-rounded, yeah. <laughs> uh, a, uh, a more defined, well-rounded uh, athlete, not just the back. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's actually one of the movements, too, for instrumentalists mm -hmm. that I would consider still not high risk if you have somebody who knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where a lot of this is gonna come in. Um, the bench can be great yep. for um, wrist stabilization, especially yep. if you've got a fat bar um, for pecs, which mm -hmm. often, you know, this is this position we end up in as instrumentalists, especially if we're in front. Very um, weak position. For... Very, very weak pecs is what this is. It yep. might seem like they're tight, but it's, mm -hmm. it's actually a weakness because you can't support with them. Um, so anything like that, um, I had another point to go with this. Shoot, it was related to the bench. Uh, wrist stability, you said? Wrist stability, I said. Yep. Um, can't remember. Oh well, tune in next time tune for that. Tune in next time for that. Hopefully I'll remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, with especially talking on the wrist stability thing, what yeah. I've seen is like anybody who has wrist issues with, mm -hmm. um, any sort of bench press movement typically just has really weak wrists. And yeah. as a musician, that's not something that you want to have. No, no, no. And it's, I think, the more I look at it contributing to, you know, ideally, for example, I'm going to use clarinet because that's my go-to, but this is, I think, a little bit true with saxes too, and certainly across the board you can find parallels. But mm -hmm. with the clarinet, you know, ideally we're not actually holding it up. Yep. We're leveraging it so that it's balanced against our upper teeth and our thumb. Mm -hmm. Take away as much of the weight as possible. Well, that's still fine and dandy, but if you don't have any wrist stability, yeah. you can be in a bunch of different positions and still kind of get that balancing effect to happen, but still be putting extra strain on your wrist. Mm -hmm. um, same thing too when you look at string players who sometimes end up in this very broken wrist type position. I'm not a string player, you can tell, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> But Neither am I. if you're in this position all the time and you're in, encouraging, and sometimes you can see it in, not usually in the um, top tier professional and elite string players, but in the younger ones, it can get really, really exaggerated. Mm -hmm. and the string teachers are ideally working on that, but that's a very, you're encouraging lengthening here and shortening here, mm -hmm. and it's just all out of balance. Something has to be done to balance that out, yeah. theoretically, mm -hmm. or else you're gonna end up, um, you increase anyway, the likelihood of injury and discomfort, pain. Yeah, and arthritis, stuff. carpal tunnel, oh, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, all the stuff that we're, get, we're seeing musicians get yeah. surgery for now. Yeah. Um, and if we wanna cross over into something like dance, maybe this is where if you've got a hip issue, you've got a hip shift. Mm -hmm. um, so you move okay when you're dancing, but there's discomfort in one of your hips, and if you try to squat, which, I don't know how many dancers actually do that at this point. It seems to be kind of split. Um, but if you're doing an actual loaded squat, you can see a shift in one direction or the other in the hips. Maybe you don't want to strain that or push that work mm -hmm. in season when you have to be on point. But this would be the time to work on that issue too. Yeah. So, so to kind of summarize mm -hmm. the off season, off season is working your weaknesses, working the things that you don't normally work in season, and then uh, working on the things that you can't afford to work on in season. Yes. Right. Yes. So that's uh, that's grip and anything that's hand intensive for, for most people. Yeah, for um, the instrumentalist. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that's going to affect your performance mm -hmm. in season, but you can't risk making it worse. Right. That this is where to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you know the we kind of talked a little bit about the time that you would want to spend on that But that would be mm -hmm. hopefully ideally minimum of six weeks. That would be ideal yeah. um, And it just kind of depends again on uh, The good part here is for the less experienced performers. They're typically working less mm -hmm. Which means that they're going to have a longer off season that's all, that's Which good. means they can do more prep work exactly and then the more advanced performers mm -hmm. who have been around like for a long time, mm -hmm. um, you're experienced to enough to know what kind of time frame you need, really. Like, okay, I know that in season is going to be this long, it's gonna feel this rough, I'm gonna need about this much time pre-season to mm -hmm. make sure I'm ready. So that leaves X amount of time for off-season work. 
So that makes sense. Yeah, and if you don't know, reach out to somebody who has experience, um, especially somebody who kind of cross dabbles, like um, like us here actually, <laughs> uh, can kind of guide you towards what sort of time frames are you looking at. That's where mentoring really yeah. comes into play. Yeah, exactly, and that's all that's all so individual based on what you do. Yeah, um, and that you kind of really need somebody to help you with that if you don't know. Yes. So. Yes. Um, Pay attention to what you don't know and uh, mm -hmm. get somebody who can help you with that. Ask questions. Yep. And yep. a good person to reach out to. You can always reach out to me. Um, my name, of course, is Dr. Jen Cabis, And you can find me uh, on my website, tunedandtonedperformance.com. That's tuned with a D and toned with a D. Um, you can also find me on Facebook and Instagram at, at tunedandtonedperformance. Uh, we also have a YouTube page. Um, I think you can contact me through any of those, so feel free to reach out. Um, you want to do any plugs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you can find me on Instagram at Coach B Chambers, and then the gym is Big Ben Strength and Conditioning. So on Instagram, it's at Big Ben Strength and Conditioning. Same thing on Facebook, uh, same thing on YouTube, and you can reach out to us on any of those platforms. And then our website is www.bigbendsc.com. Thanks guys.